Welcome to Stocks to Watch, Investing Insights, where we dive into the exciting and evolving world of commodities, markets, and trends with today's most insightful leaders. I'm your host, Ashley Berry, and joining us today is someone you'll certainly want to hear from, John Fennick, president of Fennick Consulting. John's global firm specializes in alternative investments, retirement, and asset allocation. He's always ahead of the curve when it comes to market trends. John, we are excited to have you back on the show today. Welcome. Thanks for having me back, Ashley. Of course. So commodities certainly having a moment. Uh, I'd like to ask you maybe what trends you see right now that young investors particularly should be paying attention to and what's sparking the most excitement in this space? Well, right now gold is running up you know, today is the Fed day and gold almost at 2600 for the first time ever. It, it topped out at 2595. But what's important for any investor to look at is that last year it was holding 1900 an ounce. Now it's holding 2300 an ounce. So you're building floors at higher prices, right? We call that higher lows that are being made on the commodity itself. And so you have to get interested in gold related investments, I think, if you're young, because they have not taken off yet. Um, there's a few gold stocks we'll mention today that they may want to take a look at. But again, I don't know anyone's risk tolerance. So some of these are, are risky and some of them are not appropriate for everyone. Um, however, you know that's why you do the research. You have to go to these websites. You have, to, you have to look at the news flow. There's always a contact person on the contacts tab. So it's important to reach out to the company too, not just buy something based on what I'm saying or anyone's saying mm -hmm. and, and get some more information, right? If you don't know how to read financials. Yes, and so you're talking about doing your research. Another question I wanted to ask you, which by the way is an excellent point. Um, some people might think that it's too late to get into gold um, or are we mm -hmm. really looking at new opportunities ahead? Well, if you look at gold, let's just say at 2600, which today it closed around 2550, but let's round up because it almost got there today. Mm -hmm. um, if you see, you know, an 8% move in gold, that gets us above 2800, right? Uh, so no one really had 2800 on their on their radar for this year, including myself. My target was 2500 by the end of the year when I announced that in January. So is 8% exciting to a young investor? I, I would argue no. You know, I think. What would be exciting is if you see gold from go from 2600 to 2800, gold stocks are going to go berserk and you want to own gold stocks because who knows what they can go up, right? I mean, many of these companies are right on the precipice of breakouts. I noted to my followers today, a couple of silver and gold stocks are making two, two and a half year highs. And that's really bullish because you are starting to see money flow into these stocks finally. Um, I mean, some of them in the, in the big cap space, like Agnico, as we've pointed out on your show, since $60 a share, I think, it's now trading at 82. Um, you know, the stock has been in an uptrend for months and it looks beautiful. So do you chase an Agnico? I don't think so. I mean, you can buy other things that would be, you know, replacements for that in a portfolio. And so, yeah, you just have to kind of decide for yourself as a younger investor, okay, I believe in the gold trend. But buying physical gold for me at my like age might not be the most appropriate thing. Maybe I'm I'm ready to take risk and I can buy gold equities, right? That that's probably the best way to play it right now, in my opinion. Excellent point. You know, you mentioned silver. I know there's a lot of buzz around silver and uranium right now. Um, for those in, you know, navigating these markets, is now the right time to dive in or should they hold off? Well, silver is above $30 an ounce, barely as we speak, and silver has been major resistance for 11 years. So this is only the second time this year that we've been over 30 with some confidence. That is a very positive development. You know, you need to be buying silver if you believe in gold. They're not necessarily connected at the hip because silver has much more of an industrial bias, um, but uh, it is still a precious metal. If you go back and look at April of 2020, the chart on silver looked beautiful coming out of that V-shaped bottom. If you look at February 2022, when we had the Russia invasion, silver popped right away. Like, I mean, these are very good indications to tell any investor that silver is still a precious metal. It's still looked at like as a safe haven, and yet it's super cheap versus gold, right? So we've been spending a lot of our time on silver stocks that have potential here, you know, 
as silver ascends in price. Um, we've talked about SilverX on your show before, uh, AGX, PF. I met with Jose last week at Beaver Creek. You know, they've done some difficult things over the last 12 months. They basically got rid of 50% of their, their field staff last fall. They have, have cut costs. Their, their costs are still high, you know, for a silver producer. But what else has changed over the last 12 months, Ashley, is that Peru has really improved as a jurisdiction. You know, Castillo was in power there only about 20 months ago, and he put a dark shadow over that country. But in talking to Jose, who actually lives in Peru, I mean, I think that's important to note. You know, a lot of times you get bad information from the web, and and even some of these websites don't really tell you that the CEO lives right near the project, right? So he has a very good understanding of what the good and the bad and the ugly is in Peru. And he said, John, we're just a resilient people. Like we've put up with so much in the past, like we just bounce back. And, mm. and I, I would agree with that. Castillo has been a, a non-factor now for 20 months, yet the market still looks at Peru and says, oh gosh, you know, that's that's a risky place. Of course there's risk. There's risk anywhere. There's risk in the US. You just have to be able to assess that risk. And by talking to CEOs, that's I think what we do differently is that I spent time last week to talk to 28 CEOs in three days at Beaver Creek. And that's a lot of work. You know, um, most people are not talking to 28 CEOs a year and we did it in three days. Right. So like we're out there trying to get, you know, tidbits of information for, for investors. And that's why we charge what we charge. We don't charge $10 a month because we're providing real value. Um, you know, the other stock that I met with last week that impressed me was Abra Silver in the silver space. That's uh, ABBRF. You know, John's a polished CEO. He's, he's ex-capital markets. He's been with the company since, you know, the stock really started to find silver, you know, and, and part of that's a credit to him. Part of that's a credit to his team in the field, right? But they're growing their deposit in Argentina, another country, which is, I think, turned the corner over the last couple of months. And, you know, they have 258 million ounces of silver now. I mean, when I look at my entire universe of silver stocks, that's top 10 for size of deposit, you know, and the stock's still trading at 0.2, um, you know, uh, price to NAV. I mean, in a normal market, you should be trading at 0.7, I'd say, you know, and so, so are we implying a 350% move from today? No. But I'm saying even if we were wrong and it went from 0.2 to 0.4, that's implying a 100% move. And at a dollar seventy five US, I mean, I, I just think that's a great idea. I mean, you want to be buying bigger deposits with good management that are cashed up. Like that's hard to find all three, and and that's what Aver Silver offers right now. Yeah, terrific insights. And I know that these meetings really help propel the mission forward and help you understand what's out there, what to pay attention to. You mentioned that you were at Beaver Creek. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, what's coming up this fall, conferences that you'll be attending or hosting. So, yeah, I'm, I'm co-hosting an event next month uh, that will be at the Four Seasons Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, that's October 20th through the 22nd. We're very excited about this. We've taken a different type of approach in two different ways. One is, I think most conferences are way too crowded. Last week at Beaver Creek, I I'm guessing 150 companies, but then you have another 100 plus on the periphery that were just showing up to meet in the lobby and stuff, and it's chaos. I mean, it's just a little bit too much for me at that elevation, uh, which was over 8,500 feet <laughs> um, in Colorado. And, and then... Um, what we've done differently is we're, we're going to have 35 companies attend ours, right? And and so that what's right? Is it right to do what Beaver did or us? It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's just different, right? I mean, they're successful. We're going to be successful. And I wish them all the best. Like they've said the same of us. So, you know, I think it's one of the things that's weird to me in this industry is that people kind of, you know, are not friendly, you know, to each other in the conference business, which is nuts. I mean... I think gold at 2,500 is going to bring a huge amount of interest in the conference space over the next two to three years. And we're going to see a lot of people that are very unqualified trying to host conferences. Mm -hmm. We are not one of them, you know, neither is Beaver Creek. They know what they're doing. So do we. So, you know, if I'm an investor, I would encourage you to go to one of those type of conferences where, you know, it's well run and we really are caring about both the company and the investor. I think that's you know, unique because we could invite 100 companies and we'd probably get 80 or 90 easily. We're inviting 35 so that 
everything is more of an intimate setting, right? And the second thing we're doing differently is we're focusing on networking and one-on-one meetings. I think Beaver Creek's model for one-on-one meetings is fantastic. I've been going there five years. Um, I had a lot of those last week myself as an investor, right? So being able to spend a half hour with a CEO and ask him or her any questions you want, man, you can get a lot of information that helps you decide, okay, am I ready to invest in this or not, right? I mean, it's just it's just really helpful to hear it directly from a leader. And then we're also doing a lot of networking there, Ashley, where we have happy hours, dinners, small group dinners, like that are, you know, golf, spa, like things that are going to be focused on having fun, but also, you know, getting to know people and build relationships. Um, beyond that, I'm speaking at Zurich, um, November 10th and 11th at the Park Hyatt there. Mm. Uh, and then I'll be moving on to London for a one-to-one mining. I'm not attending the conference per se, but I'll be doing a bunch of meetings in London uh, those two days. Yeah, sounds really exciting. Terrific insights. Um, for folks that are interested, where could they go to get more information about these conferences or, or where you're speaking? Yeah, uh, fenicconsulting.com is my website, and that basically will run down kind of my appearances. I'm sure we'll have my email on the show notes. People can email me directly, and I'm happy to tell them you know, right. the information if they've missed it. Um, the website for the conference I just mentioned next month is Top Shelf and then a hyphen, and then partners.com. And they can scan through there the different companies tab, which show you how many companies are attending and which ones. We've worked really hard to develop a list of companies that are not only diverse by size, because I think a lot of company uh, conferences are focused on big cap stocks or larger or small, small stocks, right? We have a mix. And then we have also have a mix by commodity. So we've got three or four uranium companies. We've got two royalty companies. We've got 14 gold companies, right? We're like, we're overweighting gold for a reason. I mean, gold's mm-hmm. kicking butt, right? So we're, we want to have a lot of gold companies there for investors because we think they're super cheap. Um, but we have, you know, a good mix of, of companies by commodity as well. Excellent. And, you know, speaking of gold, many people are asking about the divergence between gold prices and the performance of miners. What does that gap really mean for someone who, say, is just starting their investment journey or well on their way? I'll give you a few examples. Um, So gold is at an all-time high as we're recording this, literally pennies off an all-time high. Mm -hmm. There are stocks that we've tracked for years or owned for years on and off. One of them is 1911 gold. That is A-U-M-B-F. Sean, you know, basically met with us last week as well. And he said, look, we're coming out with our resource estimate. We've been telegraphing that to the market sometime over the next few weeks. Um, and I think from our meeting, what I gleaned from that is that they want to go into production in some you know, way within the next 24 months, which, you know, is really positive because then they would be able to capture these high gold prices, right? When you're a producer and your costs are, say, you know, 1250 and gold's at 2500 where your margins are absolutely huge. And so what I why I bring that stock up is is when I looked back at the last gold rally, meaning 2011-12 when it peaked out in 2012, you know, gold was I think I'm just look, not looking at a chart, but let's call it 1575 an ounce, which is hard to even say right now. It's like $1000 higher right now. Mm. And yet that stock had a billion dollar market cap and today it's got a 20 million dollar market cap. So it's literally worth one fiftieth of what it was worth at lower gold prices. Like it's nuts. I, I don't understand the valuation on some of these small gold stocks. Now, in fairness, things have changed. Right? They went through some hard times. The deposit hasn't been drilled. It hasn't been you know pr- it, it back in production in years. So there's some going to be some dewatering of the of the project and some other things that are needed. But let's just say. If the market cap could, could go from 20 million to 40 million, you double your money. Like, how else are you doubling your money in this market? Do you really think Apple's going to go up 100% in the next 12 months? Do you really think Amazon's going up 100% in the next 12 months? Like, this is what younger investors have to realize. We're like at a different point in the cycle right now. Tech, it's not over, but it's definitely not attractive if you want outsized gains, in my opinion. Um, you want to go to places that are like our sector, which are completely out of value, out of favor. People don't understand it. It's extremely hard to understand geology. And that's what we do differently at Fennec Consulting is we try to educate investors through meetings like I'm talking about, right? Because many investors, we have a lot of doctors, lawyers, construction workers, guys and women that don't have time 
to go to conferences like last week and and learn this stuff. So we try to sift through that information and filter it down for them in, in an easier easier way to understand. Yeah, and it's always so helpful, John. Um, you know, finally, besides gold, uh, what other commodities would you say the next generation of investors should be paying attention to that could impact the future economy? Well, I think copper is one that gets a lot of play in the news. I personally believe like nickel is something that um, is very, very interesting. And both of those elements, right? The both of those metals are in a Tesla battery, for example, right? The younger generations love Tesla, right? I mean, it's it's when you actually look under the look at the com- composition of a battery, right? It's heavy into into those kind of metals. They need a lot of both of those. I mean, Elon Musk has been out there for three years now talking about the need for clean nickel. Look at the news out today on Kitco. We're having a BRICS meeting. Uh, B R I C S. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Right? That is happening literally two days after my conference. That is not a mistake. Mm. I have people speaking on the BRICS at my conference to try to give people that are attending a, an idea about what this could mean. You know, for the future of the U.S. dollar, for example. Right? Like the U.S. dollar is going to be in trouble if the BRICS decides to learn, launch an alternative currency. Now, am I saying they're doing that next month? No, I'm saying they probably will do it next year. And you need to be prepared for that in your investment portfolio to understand like with a a drop in the US dollar, that's good things for gold and silver, that that they have an inverse relationship, right? And the reason I bring this up about nickel is that, you know, 68 to 72% of the world's production of nickel is in one country, it's Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And it, it was announced today that Indonesia is heavily considering joining the BRICS. Like, if you have a country like that join a coalition that is clearly not pro-US, then where is all this nickel coming from? That's why we own North American nickel companies. I think that one of the trends coming up is going to be, if Elon Musk is out there beating, beating the table on this, like why wouldn't a younger investor or any investor take notice of this? It's amazing to me that we still see these nickel stocks trading for pennies in the dollar. You know, um, Stillwater is in Montana, PGEZF. They're trading at seven and a half cents. The chart looks terrible, but they have a real project connected to a major in a great jurisdiction in Montana. Power Nickel, PNPNF, you know, trading at 40 cents. Terry's a great CEO. Um, he's very aggressive. He's out there drilling constantly at, at NISC and they're hitting, they're hitting copper. They're not just hitting nickel. So, you know, it's like stocks like that where you can you know, get in on the ground floor, so to speak, and then ride these stocks for the next one to three years, especially if there's disruptions in supply, like we saw with COVID. I mean, you saw what happened actually in 2020 with some of these prices. Sure. They got completely out of whack, and then the stocks responded. And then if you weren't positioned, you were chasing them. Absolutely. You know, so many important tips, especially for the younger generation. And I always so appreciate your foresight because, you know, we talk in January, six months later, what you said happens. It, it just never ceases to amaze me, John. John Fennick. Well, that's not, I wish that was always true. But that's very kind. <laughs> well, it's been true for a while. So I guess I would say keep up the momentum. I so appreciate it. John Fennick, right. president of Fennick Consulting. As always, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your expertise here on Global One Media Stocks to Watch. Best of luck with these upcoming conferences. And we'll see you soon, John. Thanks, Ashley.